you're going to have to, I'm going to have to slay some giants. Because when authority comes, are we those that could be like Jesus and answer not a mumbling word when we're getting talked too crazy? Or do you have to be right? You have to get the last word in. If so, you haven't slain that giant. Agape contrasts and completes. Eros love compares and competes for position. The fifth giant that we have to slay is our desire or our hidden agenda. Jude 1.12, a little book in the New Testament all the way next to Revelation, says these men are hidden reefs in your love feast. Another translation says these are spot in your, spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you. They're inside the church, by the way. Feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. When this person shows up with a hidden agenda, he or she often comes with words of peace and a heart of criticism. They're predators. They throw you a snowball with a rock in it. It's trickery. Judas Iscariot had a hidden agenda, didn't he? It could be said he tricked Jesus with a, with a kiss. He gave a snowball with the rock of betrayal hidden inside. Let me, oh, you're such a great, bam, betrayed. This giant lies in wait, watching for weakness and vulnerability, ready to spring its trap at any time. This giant is a user. It seeks to use life people, and every event for the express purpose of advancement of its own interests. It may, it may be the most destructive of the seven giants as it relates to relationships. It destroys unity in the church. To stand against this giant, the Apostle Paul said, we have renounced the hidden things of darkness, not walking around in craftiness. Sometimes we've got to renounce a hidden agenda that we might receive the agenda of the Lord. Don't we know that his agenda is always better? Yeah. Sometimes we get what we think is the agenda of the Lord, and God will mess up our agenda, and he'll do something different. You know, I, I made a vow a long time ago. If the presence of God falls, I'm not preaching. Why would I mess up the greater glory? Don't have to get in a seven-point exegetical message. Who cares? Our whole goal is to be changed into the image and likeness of him. That only comes by the presence of the Lord. Yeah. God's not impressed with our sermons. He's heard them all. <laughs> He's impressed with our worship, though. Let our praise to you be as incense. That's what gets him excited. Not another message. The message might excite us. We got revelation out of it. He knows everything. But when he sees a heart committed to him, May we start becoming more and more excited about the things that excite him. And then the promises of God will fall on us. Here's a litmus test on the hidden agenda. Have you renounced your hidden agendas? Or do you still have some in business, in relationships? Sixth thing, personal advantage. Same book, Jude, chapter 1, only one chapter in that book. Verse 16, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people. Why? To gain advantage. The accuser of the brethren and the flatterer of the brethren are twins. Hosanna in the highest. Same people, seven days later. Crucify him. One minute, they're flattering you, telling you how good you look. Why are they telling you that? Is it to gain a personal advantage, or is it a genuine compliment? You can tell the difference. You can feel it. Here's the thing. When somebody gives you a genuine compliment from the Lord, it esteems you. It honors you. And it makes you feel more complete in the Lord. 
when they flatter you, it feels different. You know why they flattered you? Because they want to gain an advantage, a position. They want something from you. And they know they can't get it with the truth. The same person that will flatter you or me today, if they don't get what they want, will then accuse you tomorrow. And they'll destroy you. Remember, flattery and accusation, they're twins. Whatever they've got to do, because the whole thing is to gain advantage or to tear you down. Peter had this. Peter had to slay this giant in his own life and ministry. Matthew 19, 27. This is the New Living Translation. Then Peter said unto Jesus, We've given up everything to follow you. What will we get out of it? He who serves God for money will serve the devil for better wages. <coughs> he who serves God for money will serve the devil for better wages. Why are you serving God? Is this what you'll get out of it? Are you serving him because he died for you and you love him? You know, when we first get born again, let's face it, we love him because he first loved us. Not a bad place to start. But when we grow in faith, it's no longer about what we get, it's about who he is. And then all the blessings of God start to fall upon us. People that seek a personal advantage or have not slain the giant of personal advantage, they're like parasites, they live off others. They have selfish ambition. These people always want to know what they will get for following Jesus or for following you in your ministry or place of business. They're always looking for what they're going to get. These people are dream <coughs> stealers, not dream fulfillers. They arrange to have all their meals in other people's homes then pay for these meals by flattering their host or hostess. Do you know where the word parasite comes from? It comes from a Greek word of people that would go to other people's homes to get a free meal and then pay for it with flattering words. So they get invited back again. Oh, wasn't so-and-so so nice? They spoke such nice things about me. We should have them over again. <laughs> that's where the word parasite, that's the word etymology on that. Isn't that interesting? So when a person's a parasite, you go out to dinner with them, you always end up paying. You ever have somebody like that? comes time to pay the bill, it's like they get these spiritual boxing gloves on their hands, they can't get them in their pockets. <laughs> <laughs> or they excuse themselves just at the right time. Okay. Pay for the meal if somebody wants to. <laughs> and, and, if you're always the one paying for the meal, just sit there and do a Texas Hold'em on them. Don't pay. <laughs> Wait till they do. Yeah. That's another story. Okay, whatever side of the road you're on, get, get back on the road. You know, whether you're in the ditch on the left, paying too much, you're in the ditch on the right, not paying at all, get back on the road. Balance it out. <coughs> They're dream stealers, not dream fulfillers. Every opportunity, friendship, or event is evaluated by, evaluated by what is in it for me. What am I going to get if I go tonight? It's all about me. What about me? What about me? Me? What about me? What about me? Myself and I? The Holy Trinity. Let's bow down and worship. It's all about me. <laughs> this giant has the ability and has the capacity to transform our call to be a dream enabler or fulfiller of other people to be a dream stealer of others. John 10:10. 10, 10, the thief cometh only to steal, kill, and destroyed, but Jesus Christ came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. One of the litmus tests is when you get around somebody, do you feel like they've drained you? They're a dream stealer. They haven't slain that giant yet. Love them, but just schedule your time with them. Make sure you get prayed up for you, except a call from them. You ever get around somebody, you get on the phone with them, you get off the phone, you got to call prayer line just to get back to normal? <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? They're time bands. They steal your time. But not just that, they steal your energy. You've got to watch them in ministry, too. They'll come up for prayer at the end, not really wanting deliverance. They just want to give like this counseling session. But they're counseling their problems to you with no desire to listen to the counsel that will set them free. They have no interest in freedom, no interest in deliverance. They just want to bring you down. Woe is me. 
Misery loves company. Will you join me? No. no. Thank you anyway. <laughs> oh, you don't know what I'm going through. Praise God. Well, what are you praising God? You don't know what I'm going through. Praise the Lord. Yeah. But you don't know what I'm going through. That's what you just said. You're going through it. You're not stuck in it. Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> you just pull them on through. And you know what? When you get people on the phone like that, you begin to point out, well, the cup's certainly half full then, isn't it? Not half empty. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, uh, this and that. Well, praise God. You got life in your breath and this and that. You got shoes on your feet. huh? Well, you know, I'm having trouble with this. Well, you know, I was talking to so-and-so. They got this problem. What do you think of that? Well, I'm not here to talk about them. Yeah, their problem's worse. You're probably right. It does kind of set the standard a little bit different. What do you say we pray for so-and-so? Because I think, as a matter of fact, why don't we go ahead and send them over a check and help them out and get them some food? That's good word. <laughs> I, I got to go. I got to go. Gotta go. You don't have time for me anymore? Come on, let's intercede in prayer. You see, it will separate the men from the boys. And when you take a stand, what happens is it distinguishes you and the Spirit of God in you with agape love versus their selfish love, the selfless love. Okay, litmus test. Are you helping others fulfill their God-given dreams? Or are you a dream stealer? When you hear that somebody, I'll tell you this, somebody said to me the other day, they said, David, you know, you don't call me on the phone for this, please. <laughs> They're like, you know, you did this and that, blah, 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 blah. I didn't know. You made me a business card. You designed this for me on the computer. I, I couldn't do that myself. I really appreciated that. You know, if you've got a gift, just, just do it. Well, what do I owe you? Nothing. It's a gift. Freely I've received. Freely we shall give. And that's how relationships are built because it furthers them. It makes them look better. It doesn't cause them to want to look better. You see the difference? God made them look better. Instead of them hiring somebody and I've got this wisdom and I've hired this team of people and I paid my way. There's nothing wrong with utilizing people in, in the secular world. Don't get me wrong. But do you see the difference? One enabled or fulfilled them or enabled them to fulfill their God-given call and vision and their dream. And when you do that for others, God will send people to do it for you. The last two years, I spent enabling others to fulfill their dreams in ministry. And many of you who know me know that's, that's, that's true. All over Kansas City, the nation, and the world in one form or another. I expended my time, talents, energies, serving other people. Not for what I could get. God knows. I didn't get anything. <laughs> but, but, no, not for what I could get. But because I wanted to see the kingdom advance, I submitted to other people that had kingly authority. And then God finally told me, you've passed the test. But see, I didn't even know I was in a test. Sometimes you're doing it because God tells you to do it, and other people are looking at it like, are you crazy for doing that? You know, that person doesn't even have a perfect character. Well, neither do I. You know? And if you judge people as you're climbing up the ladder and you ever fall, you'll get judgment on the way down. Just remember, the very toes that you step on on the way up, if you ever fall, are attached to the same feet that are attached to the same ankles, that are attached to the same calves, that are attached to the same thighs, that are attached to another part, that you might have to deal with on the way down. So so mercy on the way up. So if you ever do stumble, you'll reap it on the way down instead of people kicking you on the way down. You ever see somebody who was just really mean and, you know, you wonder if they've been baptized in lemon juice, you know, when they got saved. And then all of a sudden they fall after they've just wrecked relationships in the body of Christ with selfish ambition and hidden agenda and want to look good and this and that. When they fall, you're almost like, Psh, boy, I'm glad they finally got theirs. I mean, let's keep it real. We have that attitude. But somebody who's been really merciful, and I'm not saying that's the right attitude. I'm just saying, you know, human nature. Somebody who is really merciful to you, when they fall, you're like, oh. You see, they reap mercy from you because they were merciful to you. God will not be mocked. Whatever man or woman sows that, he or she will also reap. <sighs> Number seven. The seventh giant that we must overcome to enter the land of promises. These aren't external giants, they're internal giants, although they may bring, how do I say this? External circumstances may bring these internal giants to the surface that we know they're, where they're at. You know, 
What do you get out of an orange when you squeeze it? Juice. Not necessarily. <laughs> Always these trick questions from complainers. You've got to watch these preachers. What you get out of an orange when you squeeze it is whatever is in the orange. A worm might have crawled in the orange. It might have soured the orange. Is it the squeezer's fault? No. If it's a wonderful orange and the squeezer squeezes it, you don't look at the person who squeezed the orange and say, you did such a great job squeezing that orange. It tastes so good. We're like, oh, wow, that is wonderful orange juice. What vineyard did these come from? What, what farm did these come from? What kind of oranges are they? You see, we look to the orange, but yet in life, when we get squeezed by circumstances and something nasty comes up out of us, we blame the squeezer like it's their fault. Well, the devil made I can't believe so-and-so made me do it. No, they didn't make you do anything. Jesus said the prince of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. He answered not a murmuring word. He didn't respond with evil. When life squeezes you and one of these giants pops up, what happens is this. God in his love and mercy is doing what? And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. Make no agreement with be right. Make no agreement with an unholy look good. Make no agreement with an unholy feel good. There's a holy and there's an unholy. Remember that. Don't have any covenant with them. Because if you or I have covenant with them, they have dominion over us instead of us having dominion over them. <coughs> Jeremiah 48, 11, the seventh giant, is our desire to remain undisturbed. And this is a big problem in America right now. Moab has been at rest from a youth. Like wine left on its dregs, not poured from one jar to another, she has not gone into exile, so she tastes as she did, and her aroma is unchanged, undisturbed. We're not interested in change. But the scripture says we're changed into his image and likeness from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. No, we don't want change. We're happy where we're at. So you know what God has to do? He has to change circumstances around us to disrupt us, to make us uncomfortable. Here's what a preacher's job is. A preacher's job is to comfort the troubled. And his job is also to trouble the comfortable. <laughs> the desire to remain unchanged, this giant, it rebels against change. It is content, it is lukewarm, and refuses to take risk. No longer willing to leave its comfort zone, faith becomes a dirty four-letter word. R-I-S-K spells faith. And when you're unwilling to step out of the boat to leave the other 11 to do something the Lord's telling you to do because it takes you out of your comfort zone, you've got a giant that has subdued you instead of you subduing that giant. And his name is Remain Unchanged. This giant disguises himself as the need for stability or the need to preserve his reputation or honor of respectability when more is asked of him or her than he or she wants to give. It says... I will follow you, Lord, but I won't follow you quite that far. <laughs> Inconvenience becomes a barrier to our helping others. But it's my day off. It's my only day off. I can't believe they called and want me to go serve at the soup kitchen. I can't believe so-and-so called me. Is it too inconvenient to serve Jesus? Try another God. Oh, that one won't get you to heaven. Which of you, when going to war against another king, does not first sit down and calculate the cost if he, with his 10,000 soldiers, is able to defeat the other king with his 20,000 soldiers? And if not, doesn't he send forth a delegation with terms of peace? Or which of you, when going to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost if he's able to finish? Otherwise, those standing by will look by and mock and say, this man began but he was unable to finish. So it is with you, if you want to be my disciple, Jesus said, you must first sit down and calculate the cost. If any of you comes after me, Luke 14, 26, he must 
hate, or the Greek word is meseo, it means to love less, mother or father or sister or brother, even your own life, if you want to follow after me. When your family says, I want to go do this tonight, and the Lord's told you to go do something else, are you willing to submit to your family member to go do the thing of the world, or is your family member willing to submit to you to go to do the thing of the kingdom? If they're willing to submit to go do the thing of the kingdom, they're leaning into God. If you're willing to submit to them to go do the thing of the world, you're leaning away from God. Now that doesn't mean God won't tell you to take a night off church and go have some fun. Right. I recently told someone, you need to go have fun. But they're here anyway. <laughs> but, but the point is this. What side of the road are you on? One side of the ditch or the other. Got to get back on the road. Scripture says a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. You can be too churchy at times. Sometimes you just got to go veg out. And sometimes we become couch potatoes. We need to get back into the things of God. <clears throat> Inconvenience becomes a barrier to helping others. It is too inconvenient to feed the hungry. Give drink to the thirsty, invite the stranger in, clothe the naked, visit the prisoner or the sick in the hospital or home. Recently, I was exhausted. I knew I needed to go do a hospital visit. I was with a friend. We need to go over there. You know what? I don't know if God healed the person, but the fact that we were obedient to go healed their soul that somebody else cared. Other times you go by the unction of the Spirit, and God does the miracle and raises them up. Other times, the miracle is the fact that you went. I was sick and in prison, and you came unto me. I was hungry and thirsty, and you gave me food and drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty? Or naked, or clothed you, or visit you when you were sick or in prison? When you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, Jesus said, you did it unto me. Enter into the rest of my Father in heaven. For you're a sheep with a God they love. I was hungry and thirsty and you gave me no food. I was sick and in prison and you visited me not. I was naked and you clothed me not. Lord, when did we ever see you and you were in that situation? When you did it not unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it not unto me. Enter into eternal darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. For you're a goat with arrows, selfish love, not a sheep. With agape, selfless love. You know, in Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats, the only thing that separates them is what they did and did not do. But I confess Christ. I'm saved. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're children of Abraham. We're going to heaven. Jesus. <laughs> Can this type of faith save a person? Faith without works is dead. As we look at the seven giants, we must look inside at our own lives and our own conduct, not in a condemning way, but a convicting way to say, are there areas that we need to change? Do we need to launch out and do something? When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? It is said that less than 10% of the body of Christ even knows what they're called to. And of that 10%, only 10% to 20% of them are actually doing their calling, meaning of the 100% of the body of Christ, only a tithe or a tenth knows what they're called to, and off of that, only a tithe or two of those are doing it. That means 1% to 2% of the body is functioning. We're on spiritual life support. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for the life of Christ. But why don't we come off the deathbed on the breathing machine and begin to go forth and do the same works that Jesus did? The seven giants of Eros love want loyalty. Agape love wants faithfulness. Jesus was faithful even unto the cross. Eros love wants loyalty to it. Agape love wants loyalty to him. Remember, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. In closing, I want to share something. These are the seven giants. The first one to look good, the second one to feel right, the third one to be right. These are our desires. 
These first three deal with possess and intimidate. We want to possess and intimidate. The last three, hidden advantage, personal advantage, and remain undisturbed, we want to acquire and manipulate. So the top three deal with possess and intimidate. The final three deal with acquire and manipulate. And right in the middle is our control spirit, isn't it? Does this make some sense? Yeah. Yeah. Is the Lord speaking to us about some giants that are on the inside of us that we need to slay? See, you can't go slay the real Goliath in the natural until you slay the one in your life, privately. You've got to win the battle. I've got to win the battle privately. You want to know why when we go cast out demons, demons don't even bother to manifest? Because we got stuff in us that's in agreement with them. You know why some people you don't cast something out of them? It won't come out? They don't want it out. They're in agreement with that thing. That thing has license to stay. Amen or not? Hallelujah or heretic. Jesus said, the prince of the world is coming. He has nothing in me. But he had something in Peter. And Jesus saw it. I will never deny you, Lord. When the cock crows twice, you'll already have denied me thrice. Not me, Lord. Where's Peter? He's over there. Aren't you one of his disciples? I'm not one of his disciples. Well, you speak like a Galilean. No, no, let me, let me say a few curse words so you'll know it's not me. When there's still something in you or me, God will confront you with external circumstances to squeeze you, to reveal to you what's in your orange peel. And when something erupts, you're like, oh, I can't believe they made me say that. No, no, they squeezed you. What was in you came out of you or me. Yeah. Don't get angry at them for that. Thank them for being a revealer of truth. I had somebody come to me. Boy, I set them off one day. It was years ago, 15 years ago. And I mean, I set them off, got under their skin. Whew. They came back to me. They said, I want to thank you for that. I'm thinking, I thought they wanted to fight well, they did at the time. <laughs> they came back, they said, thank you for that. I said, for what? You revealed what was really in me. I didn't know it. God really used that. And that was hidden anger in me that I didn't know I had. See, we get angry at the person. We take them out. We call fire from heaven. We want them smoked. Right? We want them well done. Yeah, yeah. Not well done, they'll get paid. Sorry. Well done on that. <laughs> or do you want us to call fire from heaven? Thou knowest not what manner of spirit you're of. Is it possible that God is using that circumstance to reveal the giant that still needs to be knocked in the head in your own life privately through prayer, through reading the word, through fellowship, through fasting, that dirty seven-letter word? Mm -hmm. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. These seven giants of look good, feel right, be right, stay in control, which is really fear and insecurity <coughs> and not letting God be in control. Or the hidden advantage the personal advantage, hidden agenda, personal advantage, or to remain undisturbed. These seven are our real cause of failure and not our external circumstances. We've got to stop blaming others. Why did Adam fall? That woman you put here, she gave to me to eat. That wasn't his giant. That was his wife. The giant somehow slipped inside of him. And he didn't overcome it. Peter went to pray when Jesus said, will you tarry with me one hour? Three times Peter fell asleep. So did the other 11 disciples. Three times Jesus said, couldn't you just tarry with me one hour? 
He tried, but his eyes fell asleep. Three hours he didn't pray, and three temptations he failed. Could it be that when we spend time in prayer privately with God, we'll overcome the enemy and the natural? And when we don't spend time in prayer with God, we'll fall prey to the enemy and the natural. There's no temptation that's taken you or me except that which is common unto every man. And with the temptation, God always makes a way of escape that we might be able to bear up underneath it. The question is, are we overcoming in our prayer life on the internal giants? If so, it's easy to slay the external giants. But if the external giants still have control under us or over us, it's because we haven't possibly dealt with the giants that are the internal ones in our life. It's time to enter in, not to the promised land, but the land of promises where everything is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. As you and I deal with these, God will bless us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus and will lack nothing. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, uh, we pray tonight that uh, the word that's gone into our hearts, we thank you that it's gone through the cracks and the crevices. It's not just another teaching. It's the word of the living God. We pray that you would stay upon us, Holy Spirit, that you would not let us escape these matters. You would not let us avoid them, but you would now begin to confront us with circumstances that will reveal the giants that are still in our lives, that we might have victory.